Do you mind introducing yourself as a starter? Sure. Um, I'm Angelish Kumar. Um, I'm a urologist. I specialize in female urology. Um, and I see women who have um, all kinds of bladder issues, whether it's leaking urine or recurrent urinary tract infections um, or bladder pain. Um, so that's pretty much how I spend my day. And so why did you choose urology? Did you have like a personal reason why you? That is a question that so many little old ladies ask me. They say, <laughs> well, how, did, how did a nice girl like you end up with a job like this? Um, you know, that you just sort of fall into certain things. Um, when I was in med school, um, I was doing my rotations in the third year. You do rotations in the hospital and you kind of get a sense of what you like. And I actually thought I might like psychiatry or neurology. Um, and something happened when I did my surgery rotation. Um, my first couple of weeks I was at the Leahy Clinic and um, I was doing vascular surgery. And I, I never imagined it, but I actually loved being in the operating room. And then the second two weeks of the rotation was actually urology. And I found myself um, just being with a, a bunch of people who I really liked hanging out with in the OR, doing rounds. Um, I was actually just having a lot of fun and learning a lot um, and really excited by the whole field. Um, and so that's kind of how I, I ended up in urology, which, you know, was a surprise to everybody. <laughs> and you've stayed. And I've stayed. <laughs> and you, you, you own your own private practice. Yeah. So, I mean, when I first came out into practice, um, I was practicing general urology and I found that, um, you know, women tended to want to see a female urologist. Um, you kind of just have a better understanding of their issues. And, um, my practice progressively became more and more concentrated with women. And then I ultimately decided that I wanted to tailor the whole practice towards treating women and really design it so that it was a nice place for women to, come and be seen and, um, and heard and, um, feel really comfortable in the office, like look forward to coming into the office. Um, I didn't want it to feel like typical doctor's appointments where people usually dread having to go. <laughs> yeah, sterile environment. <laughs> yeah. I wanted the office to be a, a really, you know, nice looking, welcoming place. Um, the, you know, encounters that I have with people, um, you know, I, I, it's really important to me that, it's, it feels pleasant. Um, and it feels like it's worth your time to come in. Um, and, and it doesn't feel, you know, like a factory or, um, like you're not listened to or that, you know, you, you're not getting anything out of coming to the appointment. Um, so I sort of just wanted to change how the whole visit was for patients, just making it a lot more sort of intentional and, and just overall pleasant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so I want to share briefly with my listeners just how we met or how I found you, which is, I know my listeners will know this, that I was struggling with UTIs, see a gynecologist, had seen a couple urologists through my gynecologist, and then I was recommended to check out liveutifree.com, uh -huh. which is, yeah, this online resource. And I remember emailing them being like, do you have any recommendations of doctors in New York? And that's how I found you. Yeah, they are um, a very impressive um, uh, group of people. Um, you know, their their sort of research and um, interest into, you know, all things that could potentially further um, diagnosis and treatment of urinary tract infections um, is, is quite sophisticated. Um, you know, they even get into some things on their website, um, like phage therapy, um, where, which is, you know, not something that is, you know, available now, but I mean, these are the kinds of things that they're looking at. They're very up on whatever the, the cutting edge, um, research is. And I think they're even starting their own, um, research consortium, um, because oh, wow. they have such a large, you know, group of, of people who, um, suffer from this problem. Um, so yeah, their, their work is, is really interesting. Well, I'm happy that they sent me your way. <laughs> Thank you. So am I. <laughs> so I wanted to kind of, I know you, you do all types of urology, but I really wanted to focus this episode on urinary tract infections. 
I feel like it's kind of an epidemic with young women. Yeah, it's very common. I mean, over 50% of women will get a UTI in their lifetime. And then about 20 to 30% of those will have recurrent UTI. So it's an extremely um, common problem. And so for my listener who maybe doesn't know, what is a UTI? So urinary tract infection is when you get basically a bacteria um, that enters into the urinary tract, into the urethra, and then into the bladder, and it can cause an inflammatory reaction in the bladder. And that's why we some, sometimes people refer to it as cystitis, meaning inflammation in the bladder. Um, and when you have a urinary tract infection, um, usually you have symptoms of urinary urgency, like running to the bathroom, even though you just went and and like when you pee, only a few drops come out, but you have this very strong sense of urgency. Um, frequency, a lot of women have burning with urination. Um, some women don't have that symptom, um, but basically you can feel these irritative symptoms in your bladder um, and you know you know that something's going on. Why are some people more prone to them than others? Well, some people, um, you know, <laughs> That's an interesting question, and I think, um, you know, n nobody definitively knows the answer to that. Women are more prone to UTIs because the urethra is short, and so it's easier for bacteria to get in. Um, the bacteria that cause urinary tract infections have to have certain virulence properties um, that allow them to adhere to the lining of the urinary tract um, and cells in the bladder. That's how the bacteria establish infection. And so um, some people may be colonized with bacteria that is able, that has the capability to cause urinary tract infections where other people may not. I mean, most people who um, have UTIs will say, oh, I had a culture and it was E. coli. That's like the most common bacteria that causes UTIs. And there's some strains which um, have certain um, adhesive properties and some strains that don't. So you become colonized with bacteria through your gut, from what you eat, from your interactions with other people. Um, and in some women, they're colonized with bacteria that can cause UTIs and some women aren't. And then on the other side of it, some women express certain receptors um, that allow bacteria to adhere, whereas other people um, you know, may not have that, that type of expression. Um, you know, people have different immune systems. Some people may have very, um, strong immunity where, uh, their own natural defenses, um, are more protective, whereas other people, it may be more permissive. So there can be so many different factors why some people are, are prone, um, or more prone and um, other people are really lucky and don't seem to get them. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like there's some biological reasons as well as like lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, most of the reasons will be sort of, you know, biologic in terms of the proteins that your cells express, the bacteria that you're colonized by. And then lifestyle, you know, there are certain things like how stressed you are, how much sleep you're getting, things that affect how well your immune system is functioning. Um, there are also, you know, certain anatomic abnormalities that make people more prone to getting UTIs. But I mean, I'm speaking just of, you know, a, a person who just gets them with no anatomic abnormalities, which, you know, 95% of people who get them, we don't find anything, you know, when we do ultrasounds and cystoscopies, we don't find anything um, unusual about, you know, their, their anatomy or the way that their bladder looks. Um, you know, it can have to do with drinking fluids, you know, how much urine you're producing. Um, sometimes that can play into it. But I see so many women who say, you know, I drink two liters of water a day. I'm showering before and after sex. I'm peeing before and after sex. You know, it's like they're, they're so frustrated because they just feel like I'm doing, I'm sleeping 10 hours a night. I'm still getting UTIs. Mm -hmm. Um, and so sometimes, you know, despite your best efforts, this is happening on a, on a microscopic scale. Um, and so um, even modifying all those lifestyle factors, you can still be quite prone to them. I, I love hearing you say that because I think there is this misconception, especially when you don't have a doctor to kind of walk you through it, that like, oh, 
if you were doing these things, if you're peeing right. after sex, if you're wiping front from back, you shouldn't have this problem. So somehow it's your fault. Right. Yeah. A lot of women feel that way um, and that they're, that there's something that they should be doing with, you know, their daily or lifestyle habits. Um, and, you know, like I said, it's, it's really happening on a microscopic level. Um, and so, you know, no matter what you do in terms of how you wipe, how you shower, um, you know, we all have bacteria that live in our bodies, that live in our skin. And with, with this situation, um, you have certain bacteria which, which colonizes, which lives, you know, on the, the skin between the urethra and the, uh, I'm sorry, between the vagina and the anal opening. Um, we call that the perineum. Um, you have colonization of bacteria inside the vagina. And, you know, these, these reservoirs of bacteria are not um, reservoirs that you can eradicate. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you're not going to sterilize your vagina um, or your gut for that matter. And so, um, so I think that that's a, you know, it's, it's a hard concept to, to accept because bacteria in one place may be doing nothing totally benign. And then when it gets into the bladder, it suddenly causes an infection, um, which, you know, is, it causes very bothersome symptoms. And, um, e you know, it can be a tough act to balance because you can't, eradicate bacteria from your body, but you're trying to prevent it from causing infections in the urinary tract. And it's, it's very tricky. Are there certain things that I, like, for example, birth control is a big one that I feel like more and more people are on it. Does that exacerbate? Well, some birth control, um, you know, it, it depends. The, the estrogen level in the vagina is actually very important in maintaining a healthy vaginal microbiome. And, um, sometimes, uh, women who are on birth control, especially when they're on the, the low estrogen pills, like low, low estrogen, some of the, uh, birth control pills have very low levels of estrogen. So some women experience symptoms almost similar to women in menopause where they have vaginal dryness, um, pain with intercourse and the overall level of estrogen that their vagina is getting is a little too low. Um, and when you don't have enough estrogen in the vagina, you, you can lose um, the predominance of a very healthy bacteria in the vagina, which is called lactobacillus. And that lactobacillus, it, it creates a nice acidic pH in the vagina, and it makes the vagina a place which is not um, conducive to bacteria like E. coli that causes UTIs. E. coli can't thrive there when the vagina is very acidic. So um, sometimes when people are using birth control or other things that may affect their hormonal balance, um, you can get a shift in the vaginal microbiome, which um, renders people more susceptible to UTIs. Wow. So many, yeah, so many different things at play to what seems to cause them. Yeah. I mean, um, there, there certainly are a lot of different factors. Um, where, you know, like you said, it's your, it's what's happening in your own body, the bacteria that you're colonized by, you know, where that bacteria is able to thrive, um, you know, how, how easily bacteria can get up the urethra and into the urinary tract, how strong your immune defenses are. So you have all these different competing <laughs> factors. What is the difference between a recurrent UTI and a chronic UTI? So a chronic UTI is, or we also refer to it as a persistent UTI, is when the bacteria um, is never fully sort of eradicated or treated in the bladder. So sometimes, you know, for example, um, if someone takes a short course of antibiotics or they're, they're taking a subtherapeutic dose, um, they start to feel a little bit better, but the, but the bacteria is still sort of persistent in the bladder mm -hmm. and they may, they may sort of quiet it a little bit, but then as soon as they finish the antibiotic or it may even happen while they're on the antibiotic, if they're, they're not taking the right dose, um, or it doesn't have the right coverage and then the symptoms come back and they continue to culture the same organism. And some people, um, will have a nidus, like a stone where you have bacteria that's harbored in the matrices of the stone. So some people actually have something in their bladder or their kidneys where the bacteria sort of persists and the antibiotics can't penetrate it. Um, and that's why they have a persistence. 
And, you know, some, some women, you don't find a stone or anything like that, but they, they, they have persistent, you know, um, UTI, a, a persistent UTI. And, um, and then, you know, there, you, you theorize that it may be nested in the cells of the bladder um, you know, men, for example, when they get urinary tract infections, they often have the bacteria, um, harbored in the prostate gland. And for that reason, um, they, the courses of antibiotics are typically longer, like, you know, anywhere from two to three weeks to even up to six weeks. I had no idea. Um, because they need, um, basically a, a, a longer therapy of, um, of, tissue, they need tissue levels of the antibiotic for a longer period of time when you're treating the prostate. And so, um, people who have persistent infections, they typically need a longer course. Um, whereas people who have recurrent infections, which, you know, is, is the more common thing that happens like when women get postcoital UTIs, you know, where women say like, you know, I'm fine, but then when I have sex, I get another UTI. Um, and then if I don't have sex for a month, I'm fine. But the, the minute I do again, it happens again. So, so that's a recurrent UTI where you're basically getting a reascension of bacteria into the bladder. Um, and you clear it when you take antibiotics. Um, and then a few weeks later, you know, you, you, you get a reascension again, because you're, you're colonized by that bacteria in the genital area. And so, you know, like we talked about, there are certain things that sort of um, promote the bacteria being able to get back into the urinary tract. And so are those treated, you treat those differently, I'm assuming? So yeah, recurrent UTIs, um, usually when you treat each UTI, you can use a shorter, you know, or a standard course of antibiotics, I should say, which can be anywhere from three to five days. Um, I typically then also have people on a good preventive regimen after that because you, you know, you, you want to decrease the amount of recurrences if you can. Um, but if I suspect someone has a persistent UTI, like if they tell me, you know, when I stop antibiotics and I'm off antibiotics for two days and that, you know, I haven't been sexually active, I haven't been traveling, like there's not been any inciting factor. Um, and then my symptoms come back. That's when I'm much more suspicious of a, of a persistent UTI. And so when, when should people see a professional in your opinion? Well, we, we define recurrent UTIs as um, more than two or three UTIs in a period of six months. And so I think that if you're getting UTIs that frequently, um, it is worth seeing a urologist or a urogynecologist um, who, who specializes in that because you want to be on the best preventive regimen you can be. Um, and a lot of women don't realize that, you know, postcoital prophylaxis works really well. Um, it's, it's reasonably simple, um, and, and can prevent you from having those really debilitating, awful symptoms, um, which are, you know, distressing for so many people. Um, I think if you have, if you're having symptoms, um, even when you don't have a urinary tract infection, like you're, you, you get your urine tested, it's negative. You're having persistent like urgency or, um, feelings of discomfort that arise from the bladder, um, then that's another reason that, you know, you, you should see a urologist. Um, some people can develop, um, cl chronic inflammation in their bladder. Um, some people have overactive bladder or interstitial cystitis. So I think anytime you're having to think about your bladder <laughs> more than every, you know, three to four hours when you have to pee, um, you should probably see a urologist. Okay. And so the urologist will kind of help you on the wild goose chase of figuring out what's going on. Well, yeah. So, you know, of course, um, and especially in, in young women, of course, you know, you want to rule out a urinary tract infection. And then, you know, if a person, let's say, doesn't have a UTI, um, you know, the, 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 their symptoms maybe aren't as severe as a UTI. Maybe they're complaining more of like, you know, I, I, I'm that person who has to pee all the time. I'm the person who's always, you know, stopping in the car, in the middle of the car trip and, um, asking for a bathroom stop. Um, then you may be someone who maybe has more of an overactive bladder, or if your feelings of needed needing to urinate are prompted more by pain, you notice that when you eat or drink certain things, it really exacerbates your bladder symptoms. 
um, it may be a painful bladder syndrome. So um, any, you know, any situation I think where you're, you, you seem to be paying too much attention to your bladder or it's causing you pain or distress uh, warrants medical attention for sure. Totally. So I want to talk kind of prevention first, and then we can talk about treatment. What can we do for prevention, like everyday prevention? So everyday prevention, um, you know, anything that basically, like we talked about, anything that um, weakens your immune system is going to make you more prone to urinary tract infections. So things like, you know, not getting enough sleep, um, uh, managing stress. Um, a lot of women end up with a UTI in situations where they're just more, um, you know, emotionally or physically stressed, um, drinking enough water so that when you pee, you have a nice strong stream of urine, um, you know, not holding it for eight hours. Many of us are dysfunctional voiders and, um, we're busy and we go the whole day and we, you know, we realize we should pee. And then we, we say, oh no, let me get three things, three more things done before <laughs> I, before I do that. And then the next thing, you know, you know, it's, it's been eight hours and you haven't urinated. So just having, I think good habits like that is super important. Um, I, in my practice, um, I do think that there are cranberry supplements that help. Um, I take those. <laughs> I do. I take them every day. I, the Allura. The Allura. Yeah. Allura is a great product. Um, and, um, you know, the, the reason why cranberry supplements can be helpful is they have an enzyme which essentially prevents bacterial um, ad adherence to the lining of the urinary tract. You, you can, the, the, the cranberry, it, it competes with a receptor on the bacteria so that the bacteria can't stick to cells in the bladder. And that's, that's, how it initiates infection. Um, and so, you know, the, the thing with supplements is that it can be very difficult to know, um, what's really in it. I mean, supplements, they can be marketed. Anyone can really say anything on the label. Um, and so I think that's why it's been tricky, uh, in studies to demonstrate whether they truly help or not. Um, Elora, you know, as you know, is a product that, that, um, I've used for a long time in my practice. Um, and I find that it does work well. Um, and I also think that there are certain types of D-manos that can work well. And I think it just comes down to finding a, a brand that, um, you feel works for you. Sometimes I have patients who come in and they tell me they're, you know, taking other things and, and they'll say, you know, and since I've been doing that, I seem to be okay. And I'll say, then keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> What about a probiotic? So probiotics are, are very interesting um, because theoretically they should be helpful. Um, and the issue with probiotics is that we just don't really have any studies that show how well, like if you take a probiotic orally that has, let's say, lactobacillus, which we talked about earlier, you know, once it transits through your stomach, which is highly acidic and through your gut, you know, and then it has to colonize like in the vaginal area. I don't think anyone knows with oral probiotics how well it does that. Um, and so, you know, I think probiotics are generally really well tolerated. There's not risk to taking them. They may help. So I do favor the use of probiotics, but we don't have, you know, great studies that show that they work well. Um, and then the other way of using probiotics would be, you know, a vaginal probiotic suppository. Um, but again, you know, difficult to know, you know, how well it works, um, and how well it, a it actually colonizes, um, in the vagina. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do have patients, especially those who have recurrent BV or yeast infections. Um, and I, I do favor the use of probiotics because I think that there's a good possibility it can help. Um, and, um, and, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of risk to, to using a, a probiotic. So, um, I think it, it's, it's a, it's a win. <laughs> yeah, definitely. What about prevention after sex? So postcoital prophylaxis, um, usually we have patients take like one pill. Usually it's nitrofurantoin, um, immediately before or after, and that works really well because you excrete the antibiotic in the urine right when the bacteria is trying to establish infection. And the thing with, you know, sexual activity and women is 
you know, our theory is that the genital tissue around the vaginal opening, that it's colonized with bacteria. And if you're, if you're colonized with, let's say, a uropathogenic E. coli, a strain of E. coli that's able to cause UTIs, the friction of sexual activity um, allows the bacteria to sort of gain entry into the urethra. Um, some, you know, I think it's being debated right now. Some people believe that the, that the bacteria may just actually live in the bladder and somehow sexual activity activates it. Um, and I think, you know, no one knows the answer to that question right now, but, um, certainly, you know, sexual activity is probably the biggest risk factor. And a lot of women, they don't realize that it's that. And so what happens is, you know, I see so many patients where they'll say, you know, I, I keep getting these UTIs, um, and, and no one puts them on a preventive regimen. And then they think they have interstitial cystitis because they're constantly in pain. And once they go, you know, three, four months without getting a UTI and their bladder finally has time to not be constantly in cycles of inflammation, suddenly they, they go back to urinating normally again and they can, you know, st one of the most miserable things I hear is people tell me how they've stopped drinking coffee and they stopped having wine <laughs> and they've stopped eating their favorite foods because they think they have interstitial cystitis. Um, and then once, you know, the, we can prevent the UTIs, they can actually go back to, to living their normal life. Um, <laughs> is that kind of the first line treatment is antibiotics? Yeah. I mean, for, for some women actually who get UTIs, like you hear of, I, I see patients all the time who say, you know, I, I get a UTI, you know, it's painful. I take some Advil, I use a heating pad, I drink a ton of water. And, you know, sometimes people say water and cranberry juice. And then, you know, three by three, four days, my symptoms are, I'm fine. And so for sure, there are people who I, who clear UTI just, just by virtue of their immune system. Um, they, they clear them. Um, obviously, you know, in my practice, I'm seeing the people who, who don't, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and so we, we do typically use antibiotics, you know, in the setting of an acute infection. Um, you know, when, when people have bacteria in the urine, um, and they don't have symptoms, um, or let's say, you know, their urinalysis doesn't show a lot of white blood cells, red blood cells, and they have a very low level of bacteria in the urine. Um, there are instances, you know, where that does not need to be treated, um, especially if the patient is asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I see patients, I, I really take into account their symptoms, their urinalysis, and their urine culture, kind of all three things. Um, and, and, you know, I think if a patient is symptomatic and, you know, the urine is showing you in one way or another that there's either some inflammation in the bladder or, um, you know, you're getting like a presence of E. coli on the culture, even if it's in a smaller amount, um, then people do typically, um, you know, w w will improve with antibiotics. And so for the postcoital antibiotics, what if you have sex like several times in a night? So that's a really interesting question, um, and I, I do get asked that by my patients who are usually under, like, 30. <laughs> um, all the older people just don't have the energy for that. Um, but the so the antibiotic usually, like, if it's nitrofurantoin, it stays in your system for 12 hours. Okay. So, you're, you know, so the question is then, you know, there are some people who might be sexually active at 8 in the morning and then again at 11 o'clock at night. And especially people who are in long distance relationships where, you know, they don't see their partner that often, but then when they do, they're very sexually active. So I, you know, I always say that it, you've got about 12 hours. So, you know, if, if it's eight in the morning and 11 at night, then you've got to take a second one. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, for people, I have some patients who say, you know, I, I see my partner every day and we're sexually active like twice a day, every day. And for those people, you know, I don't think it's a practical option to just be on a therapeutic dose of nitrofurantoin every single day. So sometimes, so in those situations, you know, I'll have them use something called Hyprax methenamine, which has antibacterial activity in the urine um, and, you know, a good um, um, cranberry supplement. And, you know, we're just trying to do everything we can to sort of boost their own defenses. Um, and, and there are certain instances where, you know, like if, if 
they're very tired, if, if they're, you know, feeling sort of run down, then I may, you know, I may say, okay, if it's that kind of a situation, you know, use your judgment, then you might say, I'm going to take a nitro furantoin today because, or after this encounter, because, you know, I just think that I'm going to be at higher risk for getting a UTI or, you know, you're traveling or something like that. Um, so they still may, they still may elect to use it from time to time, but then I usually will do something that's kind of giving them a higher level of antibacterial activity in the urine every day. Is there a risk of dependence of taking antibiotics that frequently? It's not a risk of dependence. Um, you know, there's always a risk of developing bacterial resistance. Um, one of the reasons we actually like nitrofurantoin is that um, you don't see bacteria become resistant to it that often. So I find that it has a good resistance profile. Um, the, the bigger concern is the deleterious effects that antibiotics can have on the um, GI tract and the vagina, um, the other healthy... Causing yeast or something? Yeah, like the other healthy flora in the body. Um, Nitrofurantoin, it, it has, I think, you know, some of the least collateral damage compared to other antibiotics, and that's another reason why I like it for postcoital prophylaxis. But I certainly do have patients where you know, if they're sexually active a few times a week and they're taking nitrofurantoin every time, they do get yeast infections or BV. And, um, and then again, you know, that'll be a reason why I might take them off of it and have them use something like Hyprex instead, which is not an antibiotic. Um, it just helps to, to create that, that envi an environment in the urine, which um, is, is sort of hostile to bacterial growth. And so what if someone's having, a, like they come to you and they're like, I'm having a lot of discomfort and pain. Like I feel like my bladder is clenching, but then their urine keeps coming back clean. Obviously, you're not going to treat them with antibiotics. So so that happens, you know, not infrequently. Um, and I think when I see those, usually when I see those patients, um, they have been, you know, treated with antibiotics previously. Um, you know, because usually they've called their gynecologist or they've done some sort of a telehealth visit as the first measure. And so that's the situation where, you know, I really want to know, well, when you took antibiotics, you know, did you feel better? And a lot of times what happens is, you know, people will go to, let's say, urgent care and they'll do a urine sample. They have clear symptoms of a urinary tract infection. They'll take like three days of, you know, nitrofurantoin they'll start to feel better. And then they'll get a call from urgent care saying, you know, oh, your culture is negative. You can stop the antibiotic. And then they stop it. They don't, they're not on a prevention regimen. They have sex again. The symptoms come back again. Um, you know, they've recently taken antibiotics. Their culture is coming back negative and they can get into this sort of vicious cycle. And you can get a negative culture about 20 to 30% of the time. The cultures are, you know, they're not a, a perfect test. The sensitivity can be low depending on the bacteria, the conditions. Um, and so my question, you know, with those patients is usually, you know, when, so when you've taken antibiotics, you know, do you feel better? Does it help with your symptoms? And so for the patients who, who have started to get some relief while they've been on antibiotics, then I'm more prone to believe that they have a UTI, we're just getting a negative culture. Um, and for the people who've said, you know, no, I've been on, you know, two weeks of Cipro and, you know, I'm still having very bad bladder symptoms, then I'm more prone to believe that they don't have an active infection um, you know, that, that perhaps they did and now they have more of a, like a chronic inflammation in their bladder or hypersensitivity in the bladder, you know, as a result of some previous insult. And so how do you check for that or treat that? <clears throat> Sorry. If someone's coming and you're like, okay, I've checked everything. It's clean, but you're having this pain. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I do a couple of things. Um, these are really challenging, um, cases and, um, I'll usually have, um, patients, well, first of all, you know, I usually, I usually do a cystoscopy to take a look at the inner lining of the bladder to see if there's any, you know, sometimes I'll see something called cystitis cystica, which tells me that they probably have, do have a chronic infection. Um, and you so know, you put them to sleep and you go up the, the urethra or? No, we don't, okay. we don't put people to sleep for it. Usually we do go up the urethra, but, um, what we do is you come to the office, um, and, and you go on the table, like in a lithotomy position, like when you see the gynecologist, 
Um, we clean the whole urethral area and vaginal area with like a, a sterile soap called betadine. Um, and then we give you numbing jelly in your urethra quite liberally. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then, yeah, we have an instrument called a cystoscope, which kind of just looks like a long, thin tube. Um, and you know, the female urethra is really short, so it only has to go in a few centimeters and that allows us to look at the, um, inner lining of the bladder. Um, and I can see, you know, if there are areas of inflammation, um, you know, if in people who have what we call interstitial cystitis, sometimes we see actual lesions in the bladder, um, where it almost looks like scar tissue. And then you see these abnormal blood vessels around the outside of it. And as soon as you distend their bladder, Bladder, you know, they bleed really easily. Um, and so doing a cystoscopy, I do find it to be helpful. Um, and the other, you know, the other things that I try to do, um, sometimes I'll use a medication that helps to numb the lining of the bladder to see just as a test to see if, you know, that helps with symptoms. Some people have pelvic floor dysfunction, um, you know, and, and, and that's what's caused, you know, their bladder sort of collateral damage in that. Um, so I'll usually do a test to sort of numb the bladder. Sometimes I give people bladder installations where we put a cocktail of medicine in their bladder, um, that helps to calm inflammation, um, helps to numb the bladder and, you know, in patients with, you know, potentially a UTI situation, there's also an antibiotic in the instill. Um, so there's various things we do and, and everything that we do is sort of, you know, can be diagnostic and therapeutic at the same time. Um, but, but it's, but it's challenging. Um, you know, I think that's one of the biggest challenge challenges we face is, is women who, um, you know, have symptoms of a UTI, but their urine's testing negative. And it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's a very frustrating situation. And I think, you know, if, if like you took antibiotics and you clearly got better and you were like, okay, I know, you know, I have a UTI, this is what helps me. Um, it would be one thing, but the, the really frustrating thing is when, you know, then you take antibiotics and it's not helping you. And that's when it's, it's scary. You're like, well, what's, you know, what's happening here? How come this isn't working? Yeah. Cause it can be so debilitating. I feel like people forget that. It, yeah. It's, it's really painful. I've had UTIs. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing in the world. <laughs> um, does getting a UTI up your risk for additional infections? So, um, yes. So 20 to 30% of women who, you know, get UTIs tend to get recurrent UTIs. Um, and you know, the interesting thing is that also, um, taking antibi your, your risk for getting another infection is also higher, um, after taking antibiotics. Interesting. And, yeah. And you know, there's, there's, you know, research now into, um, the bladder microbiome and, you know, like, are we, when we take antibiotics, are we potentially, you know, killing healthy bacteria that actually help to maintain a healthy balance of bacteria and prevent overgrowth of uh, other bacteria in the bladder? Um, but, um, but yes, um, certainly having had, you know, having one UTI, um, sort of portends, um, the, 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 the future that you, you'll probably have, you know, more in your lifetime. You know, it's kind of like, okay, that dance, then how do you get off the antibiotics? Cause you want to get to a point where your body's either, you're just not getting them anymore or you're cur curing them. You don't want to just be ha having to take one every day for the rest of your life. Correct. I mean, and that's why being on a preventive regimen I think is so important. And a lot of people will say that about, you know, when I mention nitrofurantoin postcoital prophylaxis, you know, a lot of women sort of like, you know, hang their head and go, oh my God, I'm going to have to take an antibiotic every time. Um, but you're much better off just taking one and preventing an infection than having to take a full course. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I usually will try to t take people off in six months to a year and, and see what happens, you know, and see if, if, um, you can get away with maybe just taking a second cranberry pill after sexual activity. Like there are other things that we can try, but I do at least like to get it so that you've had no UTI for a good six months to a year just to, to give your, you know, bladder time to heal, to give you time that, you know, you're not dealing with this problem, um, and to try to break the cycle. Yeah. That's what I've been doing. I've been taking exactly the same medication. Is that macrobid? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. Taking macrobid after sex and I've yeah. had pretty much no infection. And yeah. like for the first time, I also feel like sometimes I can 
almost like risk it being like, right. okay, I want to see if my body, if I don't get the UTI yeah. today. Have you done that? Have you tried? Yeah. Had times and I've been okay. And you've been okay. Yeah. Or like I'll have sex maybe twice in a night or twice, I don't know, nighttime next day yeah. and like only take one and I feel fine. Right. Yeah. And before I felt like I was getting infection like once a month. It was driving me crazy. Yeah. And then, you know, what ends up happening is that you, you sort of like stop being sexually active. You know, it's like there's a becomes a fear around it. And so it's nice to know that you have a strategy that, you know, works. And a lot of, for a lot of, um, women that happens, right. Because, you know, nobody's a hundred percent compliant <laughs> with anything. <laughs> and so usually at that six month to a year follow up, um, you know, I'll say to my patient, like, has there been a time where, you know, you were sexually active and you didn't take it, you went on a trip or something, you forgot it, you know, you fell asleep, you know, and most people are like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And 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 so some some patients will say, "Oh yeah, I forgot it and I got a UTI." You know, it's like it, and then it happened you know. right away. Yeah. And other other patients will say, "Yeah, there's been a bunch of times I haven't taken it and I've been fine." And so it's almost like you're you're your own experiment. Um so most people actually when they come back in, they they tell me um whether we can, you know, stop the postcoital prophylaxis and use sort of like a second cranberry pill after um, and that actually can, can work for a lot of women. I also think there's a lot of shame and stigma, which I'm, I want to ask you about. Like, even I remember when I was getting so many UTIs, I feel like there was a paranoid thought through my partner of like, is she, che she's getting so many UTIs. Like, are you cheating on me? Or just these things that I'm like, no, it's such yeah. a silly thought. I know. So it's a funny thing because a lot of women, because you start getting them when you're sexually active or because they're temporally related to sex, um, so many women think that it is something that they're getting from their partner. But it, it's actually your own bacteria. Um, and it's really just like the friction of, you know, sexual activity um, that is causing you to get UTIs. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that when I see people for recurrent UTIs and they you know, I ask them if they're sexually active, you know, a, a decent amount of times I'll have women who will say like, no, I'm not because they assume that I mean, you know, sexually active with a partner that like has a penis, you know what I mean? And I'm like, no, you know, it could be Oral. self, it could be vibrator, it could be female partner, you know what I mean? It, it, it it's not necessarily a, a male partner. Um, it, it's your own bacteria. Um, it, you know, the bacteria from your GI tract, the, the vag, the vagina, um, that cause UTIs. Do condoms help prevent it sometimes? So actually condoms with spermicide, spermicide is a risk factor for, it puts you at increased risk for UTIs okay. because, because like we talked about that really healthy bacteria in the vagina, the lactobacillus, um, spermicide, um, depletes that. And so um, spermicide is is not good for um, UTI prevention. <laughs> and what about non-spermicide or like using lube just so things are Yeah, extra? condoms themselves, um, you know, are, are not a risk factor. Um, I, you know, I wonder if some women, if their vaginal flora is affected by the high pH of semen. Um, you know, sometimes I think that maybe, you know, that can play a role because I certainly have s seen women where they notice like if they're using a condom, they're not getting UTIs. I've had other patients where they tell me they were using a condom and then they stopped. So maybe some women, you know, the condom has spermicide, some women it doesn't. Um, so, it, but it, but it mostly is the, you know, the known risk factor is really the spermicide. Okay. Um, can you talk me through some of the mental health implications that you've seen with patients dealing with chronic urinary symptoms? Yeah. I mean, I have a, you know, a box of tissues in my office. It's such a distressing problem. Um, you know, it, it, it's one of those issues where, when you're going through that, you can't, you're not able to focus on other things in your life. So, you know, if you have a job, if you have kids, you feel like you're not able to do your job well, you're not able to take care of your kids because you're, you're in pain. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's really painful. Um, and it's really frustrating when, um, you feel like you have to be on antibiotic, your choice is to be on antibiotics all the time or be in pain. And, you know, the antibiotics, for a, a lot of people, it's not just an issue of, 
um, you know, killing other healthy bacteria in your body. You know, if you've taken Cipro before, you know, like you feel bloated, you feel tired, you know, nitrofurantoin, a lot of people feel really nauseous. Like you have to take it with food. You know, I have patients who, who've thrown it up. Like there are so many, you know, unpleasant issues when you, you have to take antibiotics. And so it's, it's, it's hugely distressing. Um, and, and like you mentioned, you know, a lot of women feel like it's their own fault that they're doing something wrong. And, and that's why they're having this issue. And, a lot of women also don't realize that so many other women suffer from this problem. And so, you know, they, they feel like, why me, you know, you know, why can't I just be able to have sex and not have to deal with, you know, burning in, in my bladder and extreme pain for days and days after, why am I being punished? Um, and so it's, it's a, it's a hugely distressing issue. And I have seen, you know, cases like more extreme cases where, you know, people have had to quit their job, you know, it's, it's deteriorated their relationships. Um, because so if it, you're not, I mean, sex, you know, sex, having sex is a healthy part of an adult relationship. Yeah. And if absolutely. you're like, I can't have sex with you because I'm having this pain, I feel like that could quickly take a toll. Yeah, it definitely does. It's, it's very, um, distressing on relationships. Um, when people lose that intimacy, you know, um, there's like a fear of sex and, um, y you know, I've certainly seen so many women just so upset by this problem. Um, and, and, you know, really like grateful <laughs> when they finally get to a place where, um, they're not in pain and they're not on antibiotics and we can find a good preventive regimen. Um, and you know, they, a lot of women bounce back and the, mm -hmm. you know, and they're like, oh, I feel like myself again. And you know, I'm not like this hysterical mess all the time because I'm in pain and I can't figure out why this keeps happening. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a hugely distressful issue. There's, but it sounds like there's many options out there available. Yeah. I mean, I, I, frankly, I wish there were more. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish we had more, um, strategies that we could use more non-antibiotic strategies, um, more inf information about, um, other types of products that may help the bladder lining to heal or, um, have antibacterial activity in the urine. Um, so I think that, you know, there, there can be so much, more work done and research done, um, to figure out like non-antibiotic, um, preventive and possibly treatment strategies, um, for urinary tract infections. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that most women for what we do have, um, the thing I see most often is that, yeah, women don't get put on a preventive regimen and then, you know, it just keeps happening. So, um, luckily, yeah, we do have a few things <laughs> that we can use, um, which, which tend to be helpful. Is there any research or studies that they're doing right now or have come out recently that you're excited about? There are a few studies um, that have come out recently, uh, or there was one sort of review um, about using medication in the bladder for urinary tract infections. Um, sometimes we we actually instill, um, and we can instill an antibiotic directly into the bladder. And I think that that's a really interesting strategy because that way you, you deliver the antibiotic where you need it and, um, you know, it doesn't have to circulate through your bloodstream and through your gut and, and affect all your other tissues. That is a strategy that has been used in patients who have had like neurogenic bladder where they have to catheterize to empty their bladder. Um, because they can leave the they can instill the antibiotic through the catheter when they catheterize, whereas a person who doesn't catheterize has to have it done in the office mm -hmm. um, or learn how to do it at home. Um, but I think that that's a, a very interesting strategy because, I mean, I have a lot of patients who they have GI issues or they've had a history of like a C. difficile infection, which is a really bad bowel infection that you can get from exposure to antibiotics. Um, and they just can't take systemic antibiotics. So, um, you know, I think that that's a, a, a really, um, interesting area of research. Um, and I, you know, I hope that we can, um, have more information about using intravesical antibiotics to even just treat urinary tract infections. Sorry to jump around a little bit, but a big one that I recently, recently, like very a couple weeks ago, learned about urea plasma. Yeah, so urea plasma um, is a small um, 
bacteria, which um, it it doesn't typically cause um, infections in the bladder. Um, it's actually found as a commensal bacteria, which means a normal bacteria in the genitourinary tracts of like young, healthy, sexually active people. In most people, um, urea plasma doesn't cause symptoms. In some people, it can cause a urethritis or like an inflammation in the urethra. And that's actually one that can happen in men and women and, and be sexually transmitted as well. Um, so, you know, urea plasma sometimes can be the cause for urinary symptoms. Um, but I have to say that I have found it uh, in, you know, many women, um, and, you know, I've, we've had situations where we found it and we've treated it and it doesn't seem to, you know, improve their symptoms much. Or, you know, when we found it, we've also found like 80,000 E. coli and that's sort of the offending agent. And so the urea plasma was just sort of an incidental finding because we were doing such a comprehensive workup. So I think, you know, there are some people who, who do get urethritis and inflammation from urea plasma, but actually the overwhelming majority of people colonize it and um, don't seem to have symptoms from and it. And they're fine. Yeah, because yeah, I was wondering, but, like, why isn't it, it doesn't seem like it's talked about that much or it's definitely not routinely tested for. Yeah, so it doesn't, it won't grow in um, standard culture. So you have to send a special test for it. So like if you do a regular culture, it takes actually a long time to grow. And in a regular culture, if nothing grows within 48 hours, they just call it negative. Um, and so, yeah, it's a special test. So we do test for in patients where, you know, they're having a lot of symptoms and the standard culture is coming back negative. And especially if they have the, like white blood cells in their urine, that sort of raises my suspicion for it. Um, but um, but we, we do test for it. But yeah, I, I guess just at my gynecologist, um, I don't know, I had never really heard it talked about that much, even just with people online, and I'm always looking this <laughs> stuff up. But multiple people, when I said, send in questions for um, the urologist today, multiple people were like, I need to know about this. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are some people who, who can develop inflammation, and, and men, and that's the other thing that, you know, if you treat a female partner for urea plasma, um, you typically should, you know, you need to treat the, the other sexual partner for it. Otherwise, you know, it can ping, it's just ping pongs back and forth. Um, and so, um, you know, and I, I, I have had, you know, I would say a handful of patients who've, who've gotten better when we found ureoplasma and treated it. But I think that most often I've seen it as a, as an incidental finding. Like a secondary thing. Yeah. I want to kind of jump through just like overall bladder health. Okay. Because it's kind of fun. Like we answered so many questions about UTIs, but like how often should I be peeing a day? Like should my pee look clear? Is that really important or is it fine if I just have a steady stream? Yeah. So um, the urine should be like a clear straw color. Um, you know, if it's looking like dark yellow, um, it, then that's too concentrated. Um, also you can sometimes tell by the smell, like when urine is really concentrated, it'll have a much stronger odor. Um, you want to pee like once every three to four hours while you're awake, um, is a like nice healthy interval. You want to have a nice strong like stream of urine. And you know, a lot of women that's an issue because I mean, just for so many reasons, you know, one is, you know, if you're at work, um, or you're out, you know, in the the bathrooms are gross. You know, you're not going to sit on the toilet. You're squatting. It's very difficult when you squat to like empty your bladder completely. You know, two is time. You know, we tend to, we're busy. We run to the bathroom. We have five minutes. We're not relaxed. Um, we don't wait for our bladder to, you know, actually contract and empty. We kind of like hover over the toilet and then just try to push urine out. Um, and so that's not a very, you know, healthy way of being. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think you want to, you know, you want to drink enough water that your urine is a clear straw color. You want to pee like once every three to four hours is a good interval. Um, you want to try to be relaxed when you're peeing so that your pelvic floor is relaxed. Um, and then your bladder can contract and, and really expel the urine with a nice strong stream. Um, because that actually also helps kind of like with, um, you know, preventing bacteria from being able to ascend the urethra and get into the urinary tract. Um, and, um, 
I'm trying to think, you know, what else in terms <laughs> of, you know, urinary health. I'm like, do, yeah, do you have any like no goes when it comes to hygiene down there? Well, first I would say if, if and I haven't seen this in a long time, but, you know, if I have a pa- patient who's having like anal sex and then vaginal, mm-hmm. I'm like, you're definitely going to get a UTI from that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that's like, you know, I think that's a no brainer. Yeah. Um, and then, um, you know, obviously things like if there's, you know, like loose stool or diarrhea, if there's any sort of possibility for stool contamination, like near the vaginal opening or urethra, you want to be pretty vigilant about that. Um, but you know, for, like I was saying, for the large majority of people, it's, it's happening on a microscopic level. And I've seen women tell me they're using this wipe and, and this soap. And, um, I think that it's really hard to prevent UTIs if you're prone to them. Yeah. Yeah. If you're, if you're already, you know, like a reasonably hygienic person, um, doing those extra things, um, doesn't typically help. A lot of people ask about, you know, like antibacterial soaps and you have to be really careful with that because, you know, then again, like you're, you're going to deplete the healthy bacteria, you know, in the vagina, um, and you, and you need that bacteria. So, um, I think, yeah, you, you, you just have to be, maintain a, a, a reasonable hygiene regimen. Yeah. Delicate balance. Do you recommend physical therapy for patients ever who are suffering from bladder issues? Yeah. So for women who have incontinence, um, especially like after childbirth, um, I definitely recommend pelvic floor physical therapy. Um, for a lot of women who might have symptoms like a UTI, who don't empty their bladder completely, who have pelvic discomfort, who have urgency frequency or the, like a feeling like their bladder aches. Um, a lot of times you find pelvic floor dysfunction there where they're tensing their their pelvic floor muscles all the time and they don't realize it. Um, it's, it's hard to have an awareness of your pelvic floor muscles. Like if you were tensing your shoulders or your jaw, you kind of recognize that, you know, like you're doing it for 15 minutes or something while you're looking at your computer and you kind of go, oh, you know, my shoulders are up by my ears. And then you lower them. When people do that in their pelvic floor, they often just, they they just don't feel it the same way. They don't recognize it. Um, and then when they're actually like peeing, they're not relaxing their pelvic floor. And then that causes a lot of, um, bladder dysfunction. So pelvic floor physical therapy can be super, super helpful, um, in that respect as well. You know, for, for, for recurrent UTIs, um, I don't think that pelvic floor PT is that helpful unless it's a patient who's like not emptying their bladder completely. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I've also seen patients in the same way that, you know, you get UTIs from sex, you know, with pelvic floor PT, there's, there's, you know, work that's done to the pelvic floor muscles through the vagina. And, you know, so I always worry that in the same way women can get a UTI from sex, they could get a UTI from, you know, having pelvic floor PT, or I've seen women where they've gotten a UTI from having a transvaginal ultrasound or an aggressive like speculum exam, you know, anything where there's, you know, something in and out of the vagina and friction and manipulation of the tissue. So, um, for for recurrent UTI patients, it can be kind of like a, you know, a double-edged sword. So sometimes actually, and, and the physical therapists hate me for this because sometimes I'll actually tell patients like, you know, I, I know you're doing great with pelvic floor PT, but, um, let's just take a little break for like six weeks until we can make sure you're having like no infections. What about like ketamine usage was a question that was sent in to me affecting bladder health. Yeah. So, um, we've seen this in, um, recreational ketamine users. Um, it's called ketamine cystitis and there's a metabolite, um, in ketamine that gets excreted in the urine and it can cause like a significant inflammation and fibrosis of the bladder. And, you know, your bladder should be like a water balloon where, you know, you, it, it fills with, with urine and it, it stores that urine under low pressure. The the bladder is very elastic. It stretches and expands. Um, and what can happen when you develop scar tissue and fibrosis is that the bladder becomes stiff. And so when it fills with urine, it can't just sort of like nicely accommodate the urine and expand. Um, the pressure goes up. It's very painful. 
Um, and people actually can transmit that pressure up to the kidneys. Um, and it can be, it can actually damage your kidneys. So it can actually be a very, um, ketamine cystitis can be a very serious condition. And what about if I'm going, you know, for now mental health therapy or they'll do it for depression therapy or yeah. anxiety and I'm going and doing it at the doctor, does it have the same effect on your bladder? I have not seen it um, in people who use it that way. Usually when we've seen ketamine cystitis, it's in people who are using it recreationally, not for treatment of depression. Interesting. Do you meet people who have bladder cancer at all? Yeah. Um, you know, certainly um, in, in the earlier years of my practice, um, you know, I was seeing all types of patients. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of people who've had uh, bladder cancer. I would say now my patient population is a little bit younger. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't see it as much in my specific practice. Um, but yeah, I mean, bladder cancer is like the fifth most common cancer. Um, and so, you know, I've certainly seen many, many cases of it. Um, throughout my time in practice. And are there certain risk factors to that? Like, yeah. is it on the rise? Are people doing lifestyle things that make you increase risk? So for bladder cancer, the biggest risk factor is smoking. Um, there are certain environmental exposures, um, like smoking, there's certain types of, um, dyes. Um, so, so that's interesting. Yeah. So, so, um, that's really the main thing. And I would say when I've seen aggressive bladder cancer, it's almost always in a patient who's, who has a significant smoking history. Um, and the other thing that I think is important is that, you know, the, the vape liquids, um, also are carcinogenic. Um, and, you know, I saw a study showing that, um, people with, um, people who vape, um, you know, were getting bladder cancer, um, more frequently, you know, th than, than people who don't. So I think vaping is also a, a risk factor as well. And so what do you, what do you, how do you test for that? Or how do you like stay aware to think, okay, maybe I'm, I don't know, to catch it early, I guess. So bladder cancer, what, what prompts us to do a workup for bladder cancer is usually someone who has blood in the urine. Um, either they see blood in their urine or when we do a, a urine test, um, it comes back with red blood cells when they look at the, like a drop of the urine under the microscope. And so, um, you know, let's say if I have a patient, you know, who comes in, um, and you know, they, have overactive bladder and I check their urine and, you know, they don't have, they have a negative culture. They don't have symptoms of like burning with urination or anything like that, but they have 10 to 20 red blood cells in their urine. That's, that's a, a an indication to do a workup to make sure that there's no cancer in the urinary tract. And so, you know, depending on age and other risk factors, um, sometimes we'll do an ultrasound of the kidneys and bladder and a cystoscopy, like I was talking about where we actually look in. And sometimes we'll do a CAT scan and a cystoscopy. Um, and so the way that you, you really look for it is, is with a cystoscopy, very similar to colonoscopy where, you know, you have your colon examined to make sure that there are no like tumors in, in the colon. Um, we do the same thing for, um, Bladders. bladder. Yeah. So what would you tell someone who's listening to our episode right now who would love to book an appointment with you but can't afford it? I would say um, definitely pay attention to when you're getting urinary tract infections and if they are postcoital because the overwhelming majority in young women are. Um, and it might not be, you know, the next day, like maybe it really hits, you know, two days later or three days later. Um, so, you know, Going on postcoital prophylaxis is a pretty, you know, simple, um, cheap, um, you know, thing that you can do. And any doctor, like a GYN, uh, um, internist, you know, anyone can prescribe that. So I would say that, you know, number one. Um, again, you know, I do think that some of the cranberry supplements, um, Elora, um, some Demano supplements are helpful. Um, and so if you have one that works for you, you know, keep doing that. Um, otherwise, you know, you can, you can try like, you know, the, the now brand Demanos, the Allura, those are really great products. You can try using a probiotic. Um, most women by, by the time they see me they're they're already, you know, peeing after sex. Um, I do think like I've seen so many patients where they'll say, 
Um, you know, I got a UTI after sex. And then after that, I started peeing after sex. And then I was fine. You know, that that alone, you know, helped them for a good period of time. Um, so I think that, you know, you should be doing that as well. Um, and, um, you know, like we talked about things like making sure your immune system is functioning well. I think that's a really um, important part of UTI prevention because, you know, a lot of times that that's what sort of tips you over the, the, the scale, you know, you'll have times where you're sexually active and you don't get one and times where, um, you do. Mm -hmm. And, and so your immune function plays a big role in that. Do you have any suggestions of questions that they should take to their provider or like language, how to talk about this stuff with a provider who maybe isn't specialized like you are? Um, yeah, I would say, um, you know, to just be aware that you may be treated for a UTI and then you may get another one. And so a lot of people, I think, think that they've just had the same UTI and, and every antibiotic that they're taking just isn't working, but actually the antibiotic is working, but they're just getting another UTI and they're not on a preventive regimen. Um, so I would say like really having a good sort of understanding of your history, you know, when you took antibiotics, did your symptoms clear how, how much time elapsed between you, you know, when, when you started having symptoms again, were you sexually active before you started having symptoms again? Um, I think really just having a good history is important. And for your, you know, for the doctor that you see, you know, if they're sort of, way of figuring things out is by actually just, you know, like hearing sort of a brief version of your story and then them asking you questions, like really directed questions. Um, I think it's just good to stay focused during that interview and like answer those questions. Um, because a lot of times everything can get kind of <laughs> jumbled and, um, and the history can get complicated. And so I think it's important to to try to like understand the the facts of what happened and stay focused. And I also think getting a second opinion if you have to. Yeah, like if you're doing something and it's not working, um, then you know, or you you're, you've not gotten any sort of um, prevention advice, um, then yeah, I think getting a second opinion is um, is a, is a, is a good idea. Yeah, and I, I feel like just advocating for yourself. Like I always say, even in my own example, like I have great insurance. I can pay out of pocket, like have a lot of access that maybe the average person doesn't. And still yeah. I feel like I went on a wild goose chase, not only with my bladder health, but also with my mental health. Yeah. Um, and so I'm like people who don't have that regularly available, it's like very easy to fall through the cracks. Yeah, it, it's, it is very easy. Um, and it is really challenging, um, when you're having a difficult problem that requires a little more attention, a little more history taking, um, you know, it, it requires certain experience and expertise. Um, you know, it, it, the way the healthcare system is functioning right now, you know, unfortunately the insurance companies don't value doctors spending time with patients at all. Um, and so most doctors have to see like, you know, 50 patients a day. Um, I so think they're getting 10 minutes with you. Exactly. Like I think, you know, both doctors and patients are, you know, have become victims and, and collateral damage of, um, the way the healthcare system is, is functioning while of course the insurance executives, you know, go home with multi-million dollar bonuses and, you know, their profits have never been better. <laughs> Um, because their responsibility is, is to their shareholders. And so, you know, what's happened is, yeah, a lot of, um, patient care has become these sort of, you know, very short, high volume visits. Um, and so I think if you have that, you do have to come in ready to advocate for yourself, like have all your information ready, know your story. Um, you know, I do think it's helpful to have read, you know, some information about your condition, um, so that you know what questions to ask. I mean, you know, a lot, a lot of patients will say like, I'm sorry, I couldn't help it. I, you know, I, I know, you know, doctors hate it when we Google things. And I mean, listen, like I Google everything too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think it's a natural, you know, thing to try to obtain information about what's going on. Um, and, um, 
you know, I, I think that it, it is good to come in armed with some information. Um, you know, you have to use judgment. Sometimes people come in having read things on chat groups um, and, you know, you know, someone will say, oh, you know, this person took some, you know, obscure supplement and, you know, should I take it? And you may know, not, you know, a lot of times I'm like, I don't know anything about that, um, you know, and because it helped one person doesn't mean it's going to help you. I don't know. Um, so I think there's a lot of information like that. You may want to be judicious about, you know, um, what, whether you're going to ask about it. You say the biggest takeaway and what you would want to instill in my listeners. I would say, you know, if anyone's listening to this because they, they suffer from recurrent urinary tract infections, it, it's super important to know that they are really common in women. Um, you know, most women feel so isolated by this problem. Um, and, you know, they usually are postcoital. Um, you know, if you're having persistent symptoms, you know, after you've had like a short course of antibiotics, it's, you know, it's possible that, you know, you, you, you your, your infection takes a little bit of a longer course of antibiotics to treat. If you feel you still have a UTI, you know, you want to sort of pursue uh, what your body is telling you. Um, and I, and I would say always, you know, having more urine tests. Like a lot of women will come in and say, oh, you know, I just called, I got a prescription. Then my, you know, my symptoms didn't go away. Now my urine's testing negative. I really favor, even though actually the guidelines for, you know, UTI say you don't have to do a urine sample. You can just get a three-day course of antibiotics. I really favor doing that because, you know, if then your symptoms aren't controlled by the antibiotic you took. Um, you know, you don't know, you don't have a culture, you don't know, was it not, maybe not sensitive? Was the duration maybe not long enough? Um, so I really favor like, you know, going in and, and doing that, that urine sample, um, because that can give you a lot of information, um, uh, a lot of the time. Yeah. And then you know what you're dealing with. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. This thank was so much fun. So much fun. Talking about my favorite topic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm super excited to hear the feedback on this episode.